uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and kick it off. Thanks everybody for coming. And thanks to those of you who are watching our replay later. I am Jeff Everhart. I'm a developer advocate with uh, WP Engine focused on headless WordPress. And I'm joined today by the man, the myth, the air fried legend, uh, Jason Ball, the creator and maintainer of WP GraphQL. And we're going to today talk with you about how you can use Faust and uh, this extension called WP GraphQL Smart Cache to improve your build times. Um, so Jason, how's it going? Thanks for joining me. Yeah, it's going well. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Um, I got a couple of things, housekeeping things that I like to do at the beginning of these before we get into it. Um, so let me go ahead and get those out of the way. Uh, the first is just like an etiquette alert. This is recorded. And like I said, there will be, you know, a hundred times more views on this replay than there will be people in this room. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the chat we use, but isn't posted anywhere. Um, so please be excellent to one another. Uh, there's, like I said, this is being recorded and we're going to have some demo resources. So just be kind to those. Like I'll be showing URLs up on the screen, but don't like send a thousand post requests to our WordPress database every second, please. Um, and before I also want to kick this off, I just, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta throw our hands up for Jason because none of this stuff would be possible really without his work. So if there's a godfather of headless WordPress, it is Jason Ball and we should all just throw our hands up uh, and say, thank you, Jason. So thanks. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for all your work, getting us here. Thanks for everything you're going to do to keep, keep us trucking. Um, but I don't really have much in the way of slides. So after this, I figured like Jason and I could really just start maybe demoing some stuff. Um, and maybe we'll start with the problem and why we kind of decided to uh, do this in the first place, Jason. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, th I think the the problem we're talking about right now is so improving build times with Fast and WP GraphQL. So that implies the problem is slow build times, right? Yeah. Um, and so when when you go headless or decoupled with WordPress, uh, a lot of folks are drawn to that uh, because of the speed benefits of static sites, right? So uh, what that means is your website ultimately is served as static files to the end users. CDN typically is serving those files, which means that your user experience is pretty fast. So a lot of folks are drawn to that. Uh, frameworks like Gatsby uh, had made that popular um, where you can, yeah. you know, uh, connect uh, your WordPress site to Gatsby. Gatsby would fetch all the data and then you would create your pages out of that. You'd have static pages. Your site is blazing fast and you're good to go. But the, the downside of that is that uh, frameworks like Gatsby, or if you're doing full static generation with Next, uh, every or time your Astro. site builds, yeah, or I built, yeah. I built an example Astro with just my blog, and it, I mean, it took six or seven minutes for this thing to build through. I mean, not yeah. even a ton of content, maybe like 150 posts, and you know, for 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 my use case, I was like, all right, cool, I don't really care, but you know, not that's not, and, and not everybody's running their blog, so yeah. Yeah, and so so there's uh, the the way static sites work, right? Is they fetch all all of your content, uh, build the pages, and then produce the assets, which are those static pages. Um, so the way to the the way we approach it to speed things up is using a feature called incremental static regeneration, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so next next supports that. Some other frameworks might as well. Um, but yeah, next and Faust, we we can take advantage of that feature to significantly reduce our build times, but still give our users that experience of visiting static sites. It also significantly, in my opinion, significantly improves the publisher experience for decoupled sites as well, because new content can be published and seen immediately. Uh, and you don't have to wait for like your whole site to rebuild. Right. So, yeah. That's and I think there was a... one other kind of element to, to doing the static, like statically generating all the stuff at build time too. Like, so I think there's, the first symptom you talked about, which is like, you get these slow builds, right? So my 150 page blog has taken six minutes to build. Like, you know, I've heard of, you know, much longer builds, build times than that. If you're statically generating everything. But I think like the other aspect of that is like the, the performance of your WordPress site. And so what we were seeing a lot on the hosting side, and like, I've seen this independently is, you know, somebody will come through and I'm going to try and generate 500 pages and maybe your build process, wherever your front end's hosted is like, I, the example I used once was like somebody from Net had a front end host on Netlify 
and it sent like hundreds of requests per second to your WordPress database. And so it's like, that's just not something that most sized WordPress sites are going to stand up to well, especially using post requests through WP GraphQL. And so like, I think that was the other symptom we were seeing a lot is the more static building you tend to do all at once, like it just hammers your WordPress site and can cause a lot of 500 responses. And then depending on how the app handles that, right? Like does the, the build fail because one page fails? Like what happens from there and, and how to, you know, how do you deal with some of those performance aspects as well? Yeah. Um, and and then also like to, speaking of like hammering the site, depending on depending on how you're building your site, uh, Gatsby, I don't know the situation now that Gatsby Cloud is on Netlify. I don't, I'm not in tune with those details right now, but if you weren't using Gatsby Cloud, then Gatsby would tend to rebuild everything anytime you like if you if you corrected a typo on one page it would try to rebuild every page so like it would hammer your site for everything mm. to correct a typo on one thing um if you're on gatsby cloud or maybe some other hosts supported the incremental builds they called it right that would that would allow just the pages that had that asset like if you corrected a typo on one post it would try to only rebuild the pages that that post was shown on um but i know a lot of hosts didn't support that feature or at least not well so you would correct one typo and then all of a sudden gatsby would be trying to fetch your entire database again um mm -hmm. and it's like well that's not really practical like you it doesn't it doesn't make sense to sync all of your data for one typo <laughs> no um, and i think that's how astro would handle it too honestly if i was doing pure static build like it would, it would just rebuild the whole thing. I don't think there's the option to really just like refresh one resource or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, so if that, if that does happen though, there are solutions like you mentioned post requests. If so Gatsby at least uses post requests, right? I think there might be ways to override that. I I'm not sure off the top of my head, you'd have to talk to folks at Gatsby, but mm -hmm. uh, when you're using a post request to the GraphQL API, that always bypasses network caches and is going to hit your WordPress server every time. Right. Um, and so that causes some overhead. There's a uh, WP GraphQL smart cache, which we'll get to. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that adds support for network caching. So if you can, if you can take advantage of using Git requests instead of post requests, you can, you can still, let's say your app was still querying your site 500 times maybe 490 of those would actually hit the static or the network cache and not actually impact your WordPress server load. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. And yeah. Yeah. So that's, we'll, yeah. That Cause that's kind of like step one in this stack. And that's what we'll kind of mm -hmm. do is we'll sort of work our way back to Faust. So we're going to start kind of at the GAT, uh, at the WP GraphQL layer. Cause like for me, so when I got into, into headless WordPress, uh, like I was new to GraphQL and one of the things that's actually surprised me was that you could even use get requests because it seemed to be just like a convention out in the community that every example that I saw was somebody sending a post request. And I was like, okay, well, I guess that makes sense with how we structure the query. Um, so, so a lot of people may not even know that that's a thing. And I think, right, Jason, that depends on like the GraphQL server implementation. So not all GraphQL servers are going to let you do this, but WP GraphQL does. And it obviously like lets you take care of the network cache piece. And so we got an example of that queued up here using smart cache. And so smart cache was this plugin that Jason made or extension uh, for WP GraphQL that, you know, sort of, I and I guess it does a couple of different things, right? It uses object cache if you want. Um, and then also has this network cache layer that you or your host can integrate with. And so on WP engines network, this just kind of works all out of the box. And so we'll show you the power of that like right here. So I've just got like a basic postman example. Um, and here I'm hitting, you know, my, my WP engine site, I've got my GraphQL endpoint. I got just a super basic post. Like I'm going to get the, the latest posts and a couple of pieces of content or fields from each one of those. So if I send that, um, it's going to take a second. That was actually kind of slow. Let's see if we can get it a little bit faster, you know? And so we're getting responses pretty much, you know, somewhere in my testing, it's really somewhere in like the 300 milliseconds to like, I don't know, 800 milliseconds usually. Um, but more importantly, like when you think about how this works on a network layer, right? Every one of these requests, because it's a post request, is making its way back to your WordPress server. 
And so a lot of the ways that WordPress hosting works is like, there's kind of a limit on how many of those requests can be in a queue at one, one time. And like when that queue kind of fills up, then all of a sudden those, any other request that's coming in, like kind of gets that 500 error. So that's really what we were seeing when people were, were using tons of post requests. So it would get in there, it would load up this queue with all of these individual unique requests. And then you would start to see performance degradation because like each one of these things is going through that full flow. Like it's hitting the Nginx layer, that's passing it back to PHP. PHP is going and getting the data from the database. And that's a sort of unique operation every time. So you can see like there's not a ton of variation there, but if we flop over to this get example where I'm basically making the same query, I just have to format it a little bit differently. And this is gnarly to look at in Postman where with Apollo and like it's messing around with Nuxt had, like there's a bunch of tools that you can use that will actually just format this for you. And so if you're gonna do this, that's my recommendation. Like don't create this in a query string, like use a tool, use a use a client of some kind to, to do this for you so that, it's actually formatted the same way. But if we send this request, like we'll see, okay, we got that 500 millisecond response time. Um, and if we come down here, we see that that was a cache miss. But now that we've done that, right, this should be in the cache again. And so if we hit it, uh, we got 300 milliseconds. Let's see if we can get that a little bit faster. 300. And so usually this is much more in the like 100 to 300 millisecond range of fetch time. But you can see that each time I hit that cache layer, I get this, you know, this hit counter increments, just sort of telling me that, hey, you're hitting the cache. So what that does for you as somebody who's building a website is that, I mean, it just gives you a ton more flexibility in building your front end, like, and it makes your WordPress server way per more performant and allows you to like get more bang for your buck out of WordPress. Um, and so Jason, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on top of that um, before I, maybe we talk about the invalidation piece. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, what, what's happening right now, it's, it is hitting the cache so that it's hitting at WP engine. It's a varnish cache. Uh, it could be whatever other cache your server could use. I have a snippet out there to show how to get this to work on light speed cache. If you, if you have mm -hmm. a server running that, um, but ultimately you have a cache in front of WordPress. So it hits that. And it's served from that cache, and then your WordPress server doesn't even have to execute anything. Um, if you if you look at the headers, <clears throat> you'll see right there uh, max age is six hundred. That's in seconds. So you could, yeah. So what that's going to do is it's going to say, hey, by default, this is going to be cached for ten minutes now, right? Um, which is great, but the problem with that then is if you're making changes to your content, you you want fresh content right and so that's so network cache has worked actually on wp engine for as mm -hmm. long as i've supported get requests like wp engine supported network caching but it's always defaulted to 10 minutes right and that's problematic for a lot of folks they want to see their content change as they publish new content or edit content so smart cache uh works with the network cache but it also triggers invalidation of relevant caches so Go, why don't you, if you, if you have your WordPress uh, dashboard yeah, open, yeah. Yeah, go, go to, uh, or let's take a look at the results of that query again. Let's, let's look at the actual data in the response. Okay. Uh, like a uh, click on oh, the yeah, body. body, body. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So what do we have? We have, yeah, we have a <laughs> list My, of posts. Uh, yeah. Strange some... multilingual site. Yeah. So um, let's, let's say you caught a typo or realized you accidentally published in a language you didn't yeah, need let's to publish go to a, Let's go to an English one I can read yeah. and we'll uh, fix a typo in there. Uh, tips for creating a home, a functional home office. All right. So let's go. All hmm. right. So we know that's in the query, right? Yeah. And that's important. Okay. And so we'll come back, go to my posts thing. Uh, where are we at? Tips for creating functional home office. So what if it's like tips for creating functional home offices or something? Like uh, yeah. That, okay. Like... All right. Yeah. We want, we got the, the modern work from home couple. They've got to have the dual offices. All right. So we'll update this. Okay. And then, right. So, so we've got fine grain cache and validation. So. Yeah. So what you, what you would expect now is like, ah, next, next time we ask for this information, we want to see the correct information, right? We don't want to get a cache for 10 minutes. So. That should invalidate the caches if you're okay. assuming you had WP GraphQL Smart Cache active, which I believe you did. Let's yeah, so, yeah. 
Uh, let's yeah, double you... check. Let's double <laughs> check before before I do the live demo fail. I believe I did. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we hit this again. All right. Well, that's good. I mean, we got a longer response time, yep. right? So, and then if we check our headers, boom, be we see missed. that that's a cache miss. And then go look at the response again, and let's see if your data is correct. Okay. For offices. All right. And then, and then we'll notice we still have a typo, right? So tips for creating a functional home offices that we should oh, get rid yeah. of a. Uh, but like, okay. let's, let's hit that. <laughs> Hold on. Let's hit that a couple of okay. times. Just see that right. it's cash, 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 cash. Yep. yep. Right. All right. So we're getting, we're getting fast responses. We're a hundred millisecond response time. And that's just wild to me, honestly, that I can be getting hundred millisecond response data from just a regular old WordPress like cache, like varnish caching is really, really appealing to me. Um, and the, there's opportunities probably to get that even faster too, right? Like, yeah. Um, okay, I know, so let's, yeah. let's, let's do this one more time. All right. So yeah, you're right. I've got to need, need to delete this article here. Update. All right. Let's just double check. This happens one more time. All right. So we should see kind of a slower response time. All right. Freshest data. See the accurate data. For functional home offices. Yep. And then if we sort of start to pound that again, you can see, yeah, okay. Back down to 300, 100, 300, 100. And okay. So we're back down to getting really super, super fast data, super fast data. Um, and oh yeah. Okay. So that's, that's awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit about the downsides of this. So we talked a little bit about the downsides of post, right? And so like the idea there is that everything gets back through. That's a unique request each time. It's being fulfilled, you know, from 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 soup to nuts every time you you make that request. The get the get alone, obviously then we can use the network cache layer. And then the smart cache piece comes in by being smart and invalidating all that cache, like right? So if I change any of the pieces of the data. Do you want to like get into how that works? Because I think it's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's really actually powerful too when you think about the invalidation piece. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, actually keep Postman open. Let's uh, take a look at the headers real quick. Uh, this is kind of this, the secret sauce, so to say. So okay. basically what happens uh, when you make a query, a GraphQL query, uh, WP GraphQL Smart Cache uh, and WP GraphQL Core, parts of each work together. Uh, to analyze the query and it determines what you asked for and what was returned and it adds these keys so you have this header here x graphql keys and if you click okay. it like yeah expand that what oh, you see wow. here okay you have like a hash of the query you have the type of graphql operation so in this case it's a query it could be a mutation or a subscription in the future um or whatever else GraphQL may introduce in the future um <laughs> and then it and then it identifies what types of things that you queried for via a list um, okay and so you see here it says list post it knows that we queried for list of posts so it tags list post and then it listens for the response and it it adds every node ID that was resolved. Okay. So response. that's like the unique, unique, unique ID, right? That isn't like has its place in the graph, I guess. Yeah. So, okay. so, and then what happens is the network cache ta uses these keys and it tags the cache with these keys. And then we, on the flip side, we listen to events in WordPress, like updating a post, create it, you know, publishing a new post or uh, deleting a post or, tags or categories mm -hmm. or users or uploading images or whatever it might be. We listen to all the events of like WordPress data. And then in response to that, if it's a, if it's a, what we consider a publish action. So that's taking uh, something that is not public, like a draft post. Uh, like if you're, if you're editing a draft post, smart cache doesn't care, like keep editing. You could save okay. it, whatever. That's fine. Because that's non-public information, right? It's not cached anywhere anyway. But when you transition that draft post to being a published uh, published post, a publish event is going to uh, uh, call purge on anything that's a list of that type, right? So since uh, if you're publishing a post, we're going to call purge on list post. Because any, any query that you have that's a list of posts... We want to make sure we have a fresh list of posts now, right? 
Because if you if you have like your homepage, for example, mm-hmm. has a list of most recent posts, you publish a new post, that should be at the top of the list, right? Yeah. Um, and usually any other list is going to now be offset by one, for example. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that that's like if you publish an event, it'll purge lists. If you edit or delete a node, like and any node in this case would be like any object in WordPress, like a post or a tag or a comment mm-hmm. or a user. Um, that's what I would consider a node. So whenever you edit or delete a node that is already publicly available, so a published post or any other publicly available node, it will purge that ID. And so any any cache that is tagged with either list post for a publish event or tagged with that individual ID for an edit or delete event, it will purge that. And then the next request will be a cache miss. And then every subsequent request will be a cache hit until it gets purged again, either by natural expiration 10 minutes by default yeah, yeah. or by an event um, which so i think that, is a good, kind of a good thing works. to call out too yeah the the that this this will this will trigger eventually so even if you don't you know this will go refresh um and i think you gave somebody some advice the other day we were talking with the convert kit dev about this and he was you know what what I'm trying to remember exactly what you said to him he asked like what's a good time for this and i think your response was something like well what's the longest you would want that to live without a natural update or something like that so like and i guess 600 sec- seconds is a decent default right and that's 10 minutes so yeah and it's always it's always kind of a balance like in how well you know your system and how well you know the queries and things like that um like if this what if this exact query were your query you you could be pretty confident that like whenever a new post is published or one of those mm-hmm. 10 posts is updated it's going to work almost no wordpress that i've ever seen has this exact query right like <laughs> it, you know like there, no. there's no there's no such thing as this basic of a site out there right we're all using plugins we're all using custom data we're all extending the graph in some way right mm-hmm. whether it's yoast seo or we're you know gravity forms or woocommerce or you know you're building your own stuff so WP Graphical Smart Cache hooks to as much core hooks and events that we can track, but like it doesn't automatically work with every single plugin that's ever been created for WordPress, right? So okay, so that's so if point. you start querying some data, like I don't know, it it will work with a lot of plugins because a lot of plugins do use core mechanisms, right? A lot of plugins do use post types and and post meta tables and things like mm-hmm. that, and so the, that stuff should should largely work out of the box if, if you're exposing it to the graph. But if you're doing something that uses custom tables, I don't know about yeah. that. I don't know what events, you know, so smart cache doesn't automatically listen to that. So if you are querying custom data that isn't being tracked somehow in like purge events from WP GraphQL smart cache, you have a couple options, let it naturally expire or go add some events to listen to yourself, right? It's only a couple lines of code to, track custom events okay. and then have them purge as well. Um, yeah. And that, that's a cool, I've had an idea for a while, maybe like next, next quarter or something where we can, I'd love to do something on building extensions, like a deeper, you know, like how do we get people working in, in WP GraphQL more? So maybe that would actually be kind of a cool thing. Like I've got this strange plugin and like, how do I invalidate using smart cache or something like that? Um, but Craig's also got a question and maybe we'll take it now. Uh, so he said, I don't need this covered immediately, uh, but wondering if there are ways to optimize mutations, which are always a post, right? And I think the answer is, yeah, I think they've got to be a post. Yeah. Um, the add to cart mutation is slow. Yeah, that's probably, I mean, WP GraphQL Smart Cache probably isn't going to help a whole lot with that, um, with okay. mutations because uh, uh, mutations are changing data there's nothing like they're always going to be uncached right um so any optimizations there's probably going to have to happen like in the wordpress layer itself okay um, uh and some of that yeah, could be I, like I, getting a bigger server i guess right i mean because at that point you're processing a write. so yeah exactly so yeah i mean there, there's probably some layers of cache that will help but the network it's going to bypass the network cache Okay. Uh, and and it's gonna hit WordPress regardless, right? Um, so yeah, there, I there's probably stuff that can be done to optimize, like minimizing the amount of data that's passed around. I'm not super well versed in that cart mutation myself, and like what what data is uh, sent around. But there's there's 
definitely stuff that could be done, I'm sure, to optimize it. But yeah, I, yeah, I don't have sure. enough context on WooCommerce. I saw, to... I, yeah, I saw a WooCommerce tweet the other day. I answered something about databases and like they were like, how do I optimize a 30 gigabyte database? And so I threw my two cents in there. And then somebody who's very into the WooCommerce e-commerce world was like, it's hilarious that they think a 30 gigabyte database is big. Like, yeah. I'm working on hundred gigabyte databases. So kind of, kind of a mind blowing moment. What we all think of scale. Well, so, um, so actually back, back to that though. The one thing, one thing that actually I think would help is making sure that's your only post request, right? Yeah. If, yeah, I mean, if I you're, say, I mean, if, if like for Gatsby, for example, if you're making a change and Gatsby's being triggered to refetch a bunch of stuff and Gatsby keeps hammering your site, and then you try to make an add to cart mutation while your site's being hammered. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's going to be slow. Like as Jeff mentioned, that's going to be put inside a queue and wait for the other request to resolve. Mm-hmm. And then that resolves. And then, uh, so uh, I I think switching from post to get requests and then letting things like mutations be the only post request, that will help. Yep. I, I don't know tangibly or not. And it might be sporadic, like, because mutations could still potentially be slow just because of what they're doing but uh that would help the less you know load your server is experiencing the Mm -hmm. faster it should be able to respond yeah yeah exactly right so if we because none of this stuff like that's the important thing about the get request is once we switch to get everything that we've done after that initial hit has not touched our wordpress server at all has not gone into that php execution queue so like, it's pretty much just every, you know, they're just skipping the line, if you will. Like they're going up, getting their, you know, like drink and going back while you've got to wait in the queue for everything else. So I think, yeah, in my mind, that would have to help, right? Like I would yeah. hope so. Just depending if you've got volume, yes. Like in my mind, that would help. Uh, I mean, it's not going to optimize it, but it just ensures that they're they're never really waiting in the queue because there's some other request that can be fulfilled outside of it um, waiting. But that's actually a really good question. Um, th- thanks for asking that, Craig. Um, okay, so let's switch gears for a second. So we've talked a little bit about smart cache and how that sort of works. Um, and so like, let's expand on this idea, Jason, about that, like, because I think our idea with all this stuff was to really just build best practices, like from front to back of this stack. And so like for us now, pretty much once we get clients over a certain size, like we're heavily recommending that they use smart cash because of what you've seen, right? I mean, it just like takes all this load off your WordPress server, makes a, a smallish WordPress server way more powerful through caching. And then also like with the invalidation, it takes away the downsides, right? Because like the REST API, for example, is cached the same way using the same network caching mechanism. But as far as I know, there's no plugin that listens to that and is going to go invalidate the network cache. So like if I get a REST API response cache in there somewhere, it's in there for 10 minutes until it revalidates. Um, So that's kind of the downside of that, where this is sort of the best of both worlds. You get the fast cache data, then you get it invalidated. Um, But we've recently tried to make Faust and WP GraphQL smart cache play better together. Um, So I'm going to open up let me see if I can drag this. I'm going to open up this article and I'm going to drop it in the chat as well because it's kind of got a couple of the things that we wanted to talk about. Um, and it's got a couple, like there's a couple of code snippets I'll reference down below. But so like Faust, and let me open up the this uh, repository and let me open up just the website. I'll drop that in the link too. But I feel like if y'all are sem- semi-aware of Faust, you probably already found their website. Um, okay, so the idea behind Faust is it's this next JS like meta meta framework for making headless WordPress sites. And I can sort of run us through like a really quick like two minute demo basically of how this works in, in practice. And then you can kind of see over here, like uh, let's see if I can actually open it. We'll do this. I'll probably cold start me real quick. Um, okay. So, so this is what it sort of looks like. Um, we got the pages directory. So right now that's where most of our examples are going. That team is now working on an experimental next 13 app directory based Faust. Um, and that's necessitating some changes to the way we do things. So like, we're definitely thinking about it, but most of the people, I think we're still sort of recommending using next 12 right now. Cause like we're still encountering some bugs with the app directory and whatever. 
And um, so one thing to call out too is if you do upgrade to next 13, all these next 12 features still work, right? So you yeah. can be on next 13 and still use like the pages oh, good directory, point. Good point. for example. You're, like That's a good point. It yeah, is, uh, I think it's right. I get those conflated sometimes. I feel like next 13 was like a hard shift to the app directory yeah. and I, that's not true. It's yeah, um, it's completely optional. Yeah, okay. So good 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 call out Jason. Yeah, let me And you can use them I'll both release. at the same time, right? Like Ooh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's you can interesting. Like you could you could define like certain paths that use the app layout and certain paths that don't. Oh, okay. That's at least my understanding. I hope I'm not spreading misinformation, but <laughs> that that's been my understanding is that it's like incrementally adoptable, right? That yeah, I, I definitely I haven't dug into that part. Um clearly I was mixed up on like, I don't know. I've just thought that and I I, I knew that in the back of my head, but I've still been saying it like most people feel like it was an overgeneralization on my part. So I'll delete my no, I won't delete it. We'll leave it. No, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> um okay, so this is kind of how how faust works it's it's centered around the uh, part of it is like centered around the idea of making um the wordpress template hierarchy like available in javascript land which is kind of really neat um and so we've got the pages directory um and we'll dig into that in a second but it all sort of starts with this faust config that just sort of like sits on top of the next config and you can kind of add in some different options like here you can see um, I'm configuring configuring it to use a certain set of templates from this WP templates directory. I've got some possible types here. I've got an actual plugin that I wrote for some data needs that this site has because it's multilingual. Um, but the way that this scenario works is like we're using the pages directory. Um, and then if I click and decide index or really WordPress node, uh, you can see here that we're sort of like, you know, we're using get static props, but then we've also got this get WordPress props function. And what these functions do is accept like the next JS con context, right? Sort of looking at, all right, what page are they requesting? And then they make a really lightweight request out to WP GraphQL to get some data about that URI. Because really that's, that's the other sort of idea with Faust. What we were seeing a lot of people do was something like this, where we'd have like posts and then we'd like create our own slug directory. And like essentially the first step for most people was like re-implementing routes that WordPress was already aware of just in Next.js, right? Like, and so I might have like a categories folder and then like a category slug template. And so I'm like really doing a bunch of work uh, to, to organize all this stuff and then writing individual queries to go get that. And so we said, you know what? Like people are already in most cases just leaning into the routes or the URIs that WordPress creates for you already. So is there a way that we could just utilize that? And that's where this WordPress node catch-all route comes in. So really, if you go to any route that's not a pre-existing page, and so that's the way that this works, right? Is it's gonna look for the highest specificity match so if there's index or I hit the preview page or like this gated page, for example, it's going to serve that page. But if it's not one of those, it's going to fall back to this WordPress node. And then I'm going to basically say, hey, go get a little bit of information about WordPress. Tell me what kind of content this is. And I think, do we still use the node by get node by URI query, yeah. Jason, or is it? okay? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's super cool. We should we should like console log the... So instead of returning well, the I think WordPress we can actually props, oh yeah, or you can just copy here, yeah. that query and paste that into graphical. Oh yeah, you want to do that? I mean, you could. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's do that for a second. Uh, oh, yeah, I got all the language junk in here. That's fine. Let, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, yeah. So this basically takes a URI and then returns you, this is, this is what's called the seed query. So this is kind of like a lightweight query uh, that runs under the hood. And I guess what do we want to do here? So um, you can probably click Prettify on it, and then and then instead of typing it there, we can uh, use the variables at the bottom. Just open up that, and then open the yeah. curly braces. It's got to be valid JSON, and then do uh, so. We just uh, uh, uh yeah, 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 just URI, and then, and then you can see. pass whatever whatever URI to any resource that exists. Let's just do the home page. What am oh. I doing here? Oh yeah, you said valid JSON, so I got to do double quotes. Yeah, double quotes. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, 
Yeah. So the yeah. So this query it it takes whatever URI you're visiting. So so that's one thing to uh, realize is important with the CMS, right? Is that the the template isn't always directly tied to the URL, right? Mm -hmm. You might have. I don't know, all of your products for your store might be under slash product slash something. But if you have a sale, you might have a different template. Or if it's a, a certain category of product, you might have a different template, right? So the URL doesn't necessarily dictate the template in real life, right? And and the way Next wanted you to do it with the like file directory structure is to yep. say, uh, your file path always, always, you know, your path to the thing, your URL always dictates the template and in practice that's just not true right um in practice data entry into a cms often dictates the actual layout like the template selector being the most explicit option in wordpress yep. right you can actually drop down and select a different template but it's going to be other which stuff. which Faust also supports too yeah just throwing exactly. it out there like so if you toggle when we get to that i'll, I'll point that out how that works yeah. So, um, so what this does, oh, it's actually right here. Template name, template. Yeah, exactly. Default. <laughs> so that this gives any, any URL, it, it's going to first detect if it's a valid URL, right? Like if you change that URI, if you input something that you know is invalid, we're going to get a null just type. Yeah, exactly. You're going to get a null. It's going to say, Hey, WordPress doesn't yeah. recognize this. And then in that case, it'll tell next, Hey, I don't recognize this. Yeah, Maybe you recognize this still. And if next still doesn't know how to resolve it, then at 404s. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so if it's a valid URL that WordPress does know about, then WordPress gives you information about that mm -hmm. thing. And it's, and the, the information is different based on what the thing is, right? Yep. And pages, so for, for example, have templates. And so you see that pages could be the front page. This one is the front page. Yeah. Let me go grab another, like uh, get a category get or a user. Yeah. I was going to say, let me grab a, you are actual, let me just. Yeah, let me do this. Let me grab another URI. Kind of just, I will copy this for now. This is going to be long and nasty. Oh, oh, come on. I don't think you copied the whole string. No, nope. permalink. There we go. Yeah, and if we run this, we're going to get just slightly different information about this. We get, you know, posts not saying that it's the front page because it's not. And so this is the seed query that runs behind the back, like in the background, basically, when you hit this WordPress node. So we go and fetch a really sort of lightweight query, get some data about this content type. And then we use that data to then determine which template to show you. So, and that follows basically the WordPress template hierarchy. And so like when I had my front page, since I have a front page.js, this is the template that gets rendered for uh, my, my root URL, right? Anything else like my posts or pages, like I've got a page, I've got a single.js. And so all of that naming convention. And so we'll kind of like all of the stuff you were familiar with in WordPress world works here if you want to use it. And so like I've had some people be like, well, I don't want to do that. And that's fine. Like you don't have to do this to use yeah. Faust. And all the other stuff, it's just one of those conventions that like exists and we felt like was a good thing to bring over. Um, and a lot of people have honestly like taken to liking it because I think this also has some like data fetching built into it. Um, like here, you know, we can pass down certain variables into our query, like we can co-locate an individual templates query within the template itself. Um, and so you just, you don't need to really query this. And if you just you know, I, I've got my template here um, and then I define my my component, basically my page component, my template component. Uh, that's a function and, you know, it returns a, a React component. But then if I specify this component.query property, it runs the query for me behind the scenes and then just dumps all of this into props. So it like sort of takes a step out of the, da the data fetching and like we just give you this sort of structure of a template where it's like, hey, here's your component, your 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 component, you know, React component. Here's your component query. Here are your component variables, and then all that stuff just gets run behind the scenes for you when that page is eventually rendered. Um, so it's like a really nice like ergonomic feel. Like I don't have to do a bunch of. I'm not writing a bunch of my own queries or at least executing them. Um, so that's kind of neat. 
uh let's see i'm just trying to keep us on track here i had yeah. to go back to our outline yeah so i realized we got a little bit away yeah. from our agenda so but folks had i've hopefully everybody had some general questions about faust i think that they kind of got answered a little bit um but so yeah bringing me back to this post my bad this 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 i tend to do this um so one of the things that we did sort of once we re- once jason had written this wp graphql smart cache and we were seeing such success with that was we decided to just under the hood make Faust use get by default using the Apollo client, Apollo client. So that's what Faust uses to do all of its data fetching. And really we were able to just like toggle an option. Um, and so all of that is enabled by default uh, for you. And uh, that means that like for you all, if you want to do Faust and you're using smart cache, like all you have to do is install smart cache. And then any of that stuff you don't have to really think about. Um, and there are a couple of things to call out in, in there when we get to that. Um, but so one of the things that we definitely want to talk about, Jason talked a little bit about the ISR technique. And I yes. think, right, we wanted to go ahead and implement that, right, Jason, show people what that looked like. Yeah, can you can you go to, let's see, um, is it your WordPress node? Do you have, uh, are you using Git static pass? Okay. Yep. So here, Git static pass, if, if you're doing static sites in Next, um a common thing that i see is that folks will do a query and or multiple queries and try and query their entire database right you have a thousand pages or a thousand posts thousand products thousand houses cars whatever your site is containing folks will query all of those things right wait for the response and then pass the paths or the URLs here. And then what next does, it says for every URL you give me here in this list of paths, Mm -hmm. I'm going to go build that page at build time, right? Uh, Which is great, cool. When your users visit the site, they're going to have a static page. Great, I love it, cool. Problem with that is like, this is going to be running anytime your build runs. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes uh, folks are like, you know, triggering web hooks or whatever. Uh, so next is going to be rebuilding your site every time. And if it's doing that via post requests, like we already talked about, it's going to be hammering your server for one. And for two, to do something like changing a typo, it's going to rebuild all these things, right? Um, which is, it's just really, it's really not necessary in my opinion. Um, uh, and, but the, the outcome of that is that you have to wait for next to do all of that stuff before the build is done. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, you don't need that. Um, so if you do what we're doing here, we we just leave empty paths. So get static paths, we leave empty array for paths and we say mm-hmm. fallback is blocking. What this means is that the first visit to any URL, it will, it will it'll be executed at runtime, right? Uh, but then after that, a static asset is generated. So one one user will have to pay the price for a server rendered page. And then after that, every single user gets a static page, right? And then what happens is uh, you can pass, you're about to do it. You can pass a revalidate time. Uh, and this could be whatever time you want um, in seconds. Mm-hmm. And what's going to happen is anytime you, that page gets traffic, next will behind the scenes rebuild the page. So all your users still get static site, uh, static assets delivered. Right, so their their experience is really fast. Next says, okay, I'm gonna check behind the scenes if this page should be rebuilt. So what's gonna happen in Faust, or you know, next if you're using Git request, it's gonna make a Git request for your GraphQL query for that template. If it's a cache hit in that uh, smart cache, there's nothing to rebuild, right? So your page just continues on. If there is something to rebuild, next is rebuilding that page behind the scenes. When the mm-hmm. page is fully rebuilt, it replaces the old version. So all your users, except for user number one, gets a static asset, even for content changes, right? Like if if you go update content, you know, correct your typo like you just did, yep. the person, the first person to see that data correction is still static. They they're not paying the price for the SSR uh rebuild, right? Next is doing that behind the scenes. So yeah. So I just push that and we'll, we'll kind of look at that. Cause I think that's kind of a really cool, a cool pattern. And this is maybe like way lower than you would want to set it, but it, but with smart cash, like you can do it that low and it doesn't really matter. 
because yeah. like you're you're not hitting your WordPress server. So and, and you're getting data way faster than you would in a normal request. Um, so it can kind of support that. Um, oh, man, I had another point. Yeah, well, while what you're waiting for that, can, can you can you just Google real quick? Go uh, Google uh, Web Dev Studios, like headless WordPress. Stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because I I want to I want to highlight the, the it's a very common this get static path it thing. Is. It, it's a very common pattern I've seen not just in the WordPress world but in like next and static generation land. Um, uh, so if you go pages. up to issues, if you, I have it highlighted in there's an issue and just search my name in there real quick. I don't uh, know. Maybe they closed it. Um. Hmm. Just do command F maybe on the page. Oh yeah, no, yeah, should not be fetching 10,000 nodes. No, okay, it should. So, so, the, so the, if you want to read more about this, you can go find this as well. But um, if you click in, yeah, let's see. This one? Yeah, click into that, yeah. So what's happening, this is a, a fairly popular headless WordPress starter. And what happens here is they're uh, get static paths they're like I mentioning, they're fetching the entire database, right? They're fetching every type of post type and they're asking for the first, what is that? 10,000, 10,000, which you'd have to go override GraphQL's like internals to even get yeah. that to happen. Yeah. So, so basically anytime this build runs, let, let's assume you had 10 post types and they actually did have 10,000 piece of content in each one. What is that? 10, 10 times 10,000, what is that, a million? Uh, I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not good at math, but yeah, yeah, that's ten, like a million. 10 times 10, 10 times 10,000. So you're, you're saying, and when I, wor I worked at newspaper when WP GraphQL was started, right? It We actually did have millions of pieces of content, mm -hmm. right? So basically, you're telling next, I don't want my build to complete until you've built all million of these pages. How, how, between builds, how many? how many of those pages do you think are going to get traffic? <laughs> like, yeah, not, yeah. Yeah. It seems like just overkill and like static is great, but like you've already yeah. kind of got a server there serving that static file in, in a lot of cases anyway. Yeah. So it just, it so, seems like overkill. In, in most cases, you don't need to rebuild your whole site. So you can do like, let's say you had, let's say you had like some really popular pages. Like I know that every single day, oh, these yeah. five pages get, you know, hammered with traffic, which is probably the case for most sites. You have a couple pages that get hammered, right? If they're being served from WordPress, you can put those pages in the paths here, right? Mm -hmm. So you can say, I want my product page, my home page, and my about us page to be built statically, right? So, so even user one doesn't have to pay that price. Uh, but then let, let, let the other ones like at the newspaper, like I said, we had a mi millions of URLs. We got lots of traffic. But on any given day, it was usually only a couple hundred URLs that were being looked at, right? Our blog post from 1926 or, you know, our newspaper article from 1926 didn't get traffic, right? So we didn't need to, there's no reason to rebuild that statically every time we make a change to the site. Mm -hmm. um, so what you can do, though, you can put a list of your most popular pages here, make sure those are built ahead of time, and then let everything else that may or may not get traffic be done First time as SSR and then serve statically after that. So that that will significantly reduce your build times, right? And that's the ultimate goal of this talk is how do we reduce our build times, right? So one, switch from post to get requests, right? Uh, and use WP GraphQL Smart Cache. You can mm -hmm. technically, like we said earlier, you can technically use get requests even without Smart Cache. You'll just have to, your data will be stale. Smart Cache will keep your data fresh. And then, yeah, get rid of generating every single page, every yep. time you build your site. And if you think think of implementing ISR and like, yeah, you, you SSR, somebody pays the SSR price, which still isn't even that necessarily it's, slow. Um, it, it's because it's still going to be yeah. cached. Um, and then if you do do that, yeah, like this is the other pattern that we see people do where I've got my, my top 10 most popular posts or whatever that do get sort of pre-rendered at build time. Um, instead of doing everything. Cause it's just, it's, yeah, it's not necessary. And like to go back to my blog example with Astro. Yeah. I mean, I've got like three posts that get the majority of my traffic and then everything else is like 
one person sort of every other day or something like that that hits it. Um, but yeah, so, so I push some of these changes that up to just so you don't Okay. Yeah. yeah, I build my dying. I mean, I guess I don't know who, whoever, whatever, whatever German. Actually, German maybe maybe you thing. do. Maybe you do leave. Maybe you do leave one in there and and rebuild it. I don't care. Whatever. We could go. Either yeah. Way. Um, okay. Well, so so yeah. So let's. I, I just push this and let's um, let's check this out real quick. I think we'll sort of kind of maybe try and do a live demo. And so this this we'll we'll see what this gets. I think it's also worth calling out too that ISR as like a feature. Um, has limitations based on the different platforms. Like Netlify supports it in a different way than Brussel supports it and it's a different way than we support it. Um, and because there's two different layers, right? When you talk about a lot of this stuff, there's what's at the CDN ultimately. And then there's what's like on the next JS server behind it. So like, you'll sort of see that in play here as we go and sort of um, make some examples. But let me, um, I guess, you know, we'll go here, I guess, to the joy of growing house plants. And right, so I've got this, I think, let me make sure. Yeah, right, my WordPress node set to uh, revalidate time of one. So basically, if if a second has passed since the last render in the background next JS, we'll go ahead and refresh that page for us. Op um, open your dev tools too. Let's look at how fast oh, this yeah. page is being served too, right? Like it, yeah, it's going to be, a good point. you know, 100 milliseconds or something probably. Yeah, yeah 87, 87 milliseconds. Right, so because yeah, that's all coming from from the CDN at this point. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, th uh, there we go. Our max okay. H one stale stale while revalidate. Okay, right. Cool. So that's kind of in in taking you know the data from the ISR piece. Um, and so like if we come back and let's see, we want to. What did I say? The joy of growing house plants outdoors. I guess house plants aren't outdoors, but we'll say they are. <laughs> right. So if I refresh this content. And click update, and then we'll just kind of let some time pass. And then I'm so going to refresh one, this page. There will have times. to be one visit. There will have to be one. Visit. Well, I think I think there will actually in in our case there might need to be two because yeah, I think one's got to clear the out the first CDN. visit triggers triggers it, and then the second visit should be fresh. Uh, yeah, I think it might be one more than that, but we'll we'll go ahead and see. So like we do this, and right, we don't get anything. So yeah, your serve and stale, then we do one more and now fresh, yep, and yep. now we've got fresh. And so like, that's kind of the benefit of the, the sort of like stale while revalidate aspect of ISR. And then also like the smart cache piece, right? Cause smart cache was smart enough to, to invalidate that we get fresh data, but it's kind of like this idea where if everything is sort of ISRing out while, while it's in real time, like depending on how fresh you need your data, like you can just let it roll. You don't need to necessarily, um, rebuild to to do this to change a title because you know that as soon as i change it you know the data cache is going to invalidate and then on its own cycle of you know two visits like nextjs is going to revalidate and re regenerate that static asset on your own so, so it's a really can, interesting pattern can you scroll up in your waterfall or whatever right there or yeah you, sure uh, yeah so look 99 milliseconds so it's still we see it's the still fresh generated. data but it's it was a static by the time yep. you visited it, you didn't pay the price for that SSR page build. Yep. You got the static asset. So both of your requests, the one with the stale data and the one with the fresh data, were both visits to static assets, right? So the page is static in both cases. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to pay any SSR price for that. No, right? It's just I think the price there is just that you'll make a change and then the next visitor will see stale data. And yeah. then they'll refresh it for the person who comes after them. Um, and like, you know, this is definitely a number that's up to you. And like, depending on your use case and like, obviously with one, it's almost going to be instant. Right. And it sort of feels that way. Right. I, yeah. One second passes. I do, I do a refresh. It revalidates. And then the next page gives me the fresh stuff. Um, but I think Faust is set to do this at 15 minutes by default. So if I don't include a value here, it does this in 15 minute increments. Um, automatically. And I will say like, there is some sort of stickiness sometimes with the CDN. So in some cases you might get a CDN version, like that's a little bit stale. And so like, uh, you know, and like Netlify's explanation of the docs, there are pretty much the same. Like the, uh, it's possible that a stale piece of data exists on the CDN node. And it's kind of got to be cleared out before it gets back to, you know, goes all the way through that rendering pipeline back to next. And it does the revalidation piece. Um, so that's definitely cool. Something worth talking about. 
Alex, so one, right one, on time. Oh, one yeah. thing to note, the the revalidate time, I would only recommend doing a low revalidate time if you're doing get requests. If yeah. you're doing post requests with a low revalidate time, destroy yourself. You're going to hammer your server, right? Because what's going to happen is every second after your page gets traffic, it's going to make a post request. It's going to bypass the network cache. It's going to hit your WordPress server. So if you're a high traffic site with a lot of URLs, every single URL that gets a visit is going to hit a post request. Yeah. Your server is going to be dying. So if you if you cannot use get requests for some reason, don't do a low revalidate. Yes. Like if if you are using get requests, especially with Smart Cache, especially on WP Engine, uh, then yeah, revalidate as low as you want. I think wpgraphql.com. I think I have a one second revalidate myself. Um, yeah. I might I might have left there at five seconds. It's it's very low. Whatever it is, very it's low. low. Um, okay, so we're we're at three o'clock. So let's let's see if we can turbo mode last through these yeah, last okay, few sorry. points, Jason. No, 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 man. This has all been great. Um, so in some cases, you may want to be able to like eject from the default in Faust and make this get request or make a post request. And so Apollo, which is what we use under the hood, basically gives you a method of doing that. And that's outlined in this post, just worth calling out. And I think right. Even if I, if I make a mutation, it still uses post and I don't need to do anything, right? I believe that is correct, yes. Okay, yeah, I believe that's how it works. If I'm if I'm making a query, then yeah, like it, it'll use get by default. If it's a mutation, it'll use post. And if I need something to make a one-off post request, you just sort of pass it this additional fetch option of and, method post and it'll do that. So typically, I think... There's probably other use cases, but one of the only ones I could think of right now would be like some sort of personalized data that yeah. like if you're doing if you're getting general data that's public to everybody, just use a regular get request. Um, a post request like would allow you to maybe specify some sort of header, like either an authentication token mm -hmm. or maybe some other identifier. Um like maybe you're doing some sort of personalization and you're passing some header yeah. that is like, hey, get this query, but filter yeah. it with whatever context, whatever global context. Like, oh, I'm in Denver, Colorado. Maybe maybe the query will return different results for folks in Denver than it would for folks in Iowa or something, you know? Like uh, that's where maybe a post request might come in handy. Maybe, but you probably even do that yeah. with get, get requested. Or, or I guess too, like right, if you were you for whatever reason that you just didn't want it cached. I can't really think of a reason why, but like that's yeah. why I included in this post because like I don't know why you would really want to do this, but somebody eventually will ask. Yeah. Um, so that's here. And then the other thing I did want us to get into real quick is the uh persistent queries option. Cause like the downside of using get is that eventually if your queries are long and complex enough, you'll get a 4, 414 error where it's like the request URI is too long. Um, and so this is one of the features that sort of helps you around that. And I think, what do we need to do, Jason? We need to first yeah. enable this in Faust. Yeah, this is this um, is really cool. So, uh, so this is a feature. Of, so Faust uses Apollo client and, and does some really cool stuff with Apollo to make it much easier for you to use. You can do this on your own. Um, yeah, and there's documentation here, but yeah. Faust does it for I... you, right? So yeah, what what Jeff's doing here in in uh, WP GraphQL, he's going to the settings. The saved queries uh, setting is yep. part of WP and I'm just GraphQL Smart Cache. Showing this, but it doesn't actually mean it's not working. So all I really needed to do to use the feature, right, was this up part. Just tell yeah. Faust, hey, use use, use persistent, persistent queries. Question. And then I'll go ahead and just run us in dev mode real quick so that we can uh, get some queries in there. Yeah, um, so and then this just enables another menu. So all I really need to do is well, let's go look fast. at that menu first. Hold on, let's look at the menu first okay, just yeah, so you yeah. can see. Oh dang it, I might have messed it up. It's probably it's probably fine. Um, uh, no, I messed it just up. Just clear them out. Just delete them all real quick. <laughs> uh, all right. So what's what's going to happen? Uh, yeah. Was it? So what's going to happen is. Um, uh, Faust, what persistent queries means is that Faust will execute a query via ID. So it will create a hash of the query. So however long your query is, it create it generates an ID for it. And Faust or Apollo is going to send that ID to WordPress and say, hey, do you have this query? If WordPress says no, if WP GraphQL says no, I don't have that, then Faust will send the full query as a post request. 
and then we'll store it. And then going forward, Faust and, or Apollo will uh, use that ID as a reference so that you don't have to send the full query string over the wire every time. Uh, so one, one, it allows you to use really long queries. And two, mm -hmm. it speeds up the transmission because instead of it, because there is a price to pay for uploading long strings, yeah. right? The server Giant has packets. to figure that out and translate it and understand it. Instead, we're sending just an ID. So that speeds things up as well. Um, All right, cool. So, so yeah, I can start clicking around. I just start navigating navigating the site, and then we'll start seeing those queries show up yeah. in, in that dashboard. And we're in dev mode too, so it's kind of yeah. slow. I don't think those are... Oh, yeah. Well, okay. It didn't look like Yeah, that. yeah, it's working. Um, and this is another feature of Faust that you get if you're kind of authenticated. Oh, the toolbar the toolbar, which is kind of cool. And like, this is something you can modify and add your own nodes to. It's just a plugin. Um, so like you could do whatever you want here. And we got a bunch of cool ideas and not enough time to build them all. Yeah. That toolbar um, yeah. is a react component. It's not a, it's not actually from WordPress, even though it looks like it, which no, is really it cool. Is. Yeah. But you can click back here and get into WordPress. And I think like, right. There's like an edit this page. Yeah. So let's back go in here. Let's... So it's kind of neat. Like, I think yeah, it's it is super really cool. cool. All right, yeah, but let's let's hop back in so here refresh right? and refresh page, this. And you should, yeah, so you'll see the queries here. Um, if you click into one of them, what you'll see here is uh, that it's stored in WordPress and you see the whole document. So whatever, however you're writing your queries in Faust or Apollo, if you're not using Faust um, or whatever client you're using, uh, it will store that query, the whole document. And then over on the right side, you see it has these aliases. So these are the IDs. These are the IDs that... Um, identify this particular query the reason you see multiple is we 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 do it for every variation of the query that we can detect right so if you have the exact same query with different spacing that's technically a different hash right so apollo might not uh strip the spaces where other clients might strip the spaces things like that so either of these would ultimately execute the same mm -hmm. query um but yeah, you can, and then there's you, some cool options too, like right, allow deny. Um, so if you want to kind of like whitelist certain queries, right? This 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 gives you a little bit more flexibility, I think, in doing that. And if yep. I understand it correctly, and yeah, then so you can also is this the cache like time to live basically? Yeah, exactly. So what you could do here is say like, oh, my query that uh, builds my user profile page, like authors aren't updated that often, maybe. Right. So we can set that max age to two hours or 24 hours mm -hmm. even or whatever and just say, hey, we'll let that one naturally expire after a full day where my home page query, maybe maybe we'll have that naturally expire after two minutes. Right. Yeah. Like we want to make sure if if an event for whatever reason didn't cause it to be evicted, let's let it naturally expire faster. See, and right? to me, that's that's just such a cool thing. And I think really powerful for large sites, because like. You can kind of get a okay, get a sense for all these queries and like really thinking about it at a granular level. Like, how long does you're right? Like, I'm mean, I mean, I'm not going to come up and uh, most people aren't going to update author details and like, yeah, that could exist for a day and I don't care. Um, and so having that level of flexibility, I think, is really cool. And to some degree, it also lets you like secure it a little bit better. I yeah. think because um, if you come down to the settings, right? Like, and just maybe you can walk me through how the allow list works. Yeah, sure. Like if I do this, like allow only specific queries, right? And then I go into each query and basically enable it so that yeah. my endpoint's open, but only certain things can be made against it. And like, that's a question I get a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, by default, the behavior is your GraphQL endpoint is public, right? So um, that may or may not work for your project or your company or whatever. Uh, you might say, hey, we can't leave this public for whatever, whatever reason you decide that. So what you could do, what you could do is upload your queries uh, to the persistent queries UI. We don't have like the greatest of mechanisms for that right now. It's it's a custom post type, so you could import it however you import custom post types. So like WP all import would work or uh, XML file and using WordPress import. Mm -hmm. Over time, hopefully we have better tooling around that to help you like maybe get a list of queries from Apollo, for example, and sync it. But at the moment, That'd be kind of on you to figure out. But what you could do is say, I only want to allow specific queries. And then whatever is in that list of GraphQL documents, those are the only queries that will be allowed. Any other query would be rejected, right? 
Um, so that allows you to, to say, okay, we're building our front end application. We're going to defend our queries in that application. And then we'll collect a list of those queries and we'll sync it with our WordPress server. So now our front end application and our server are on the same page, what queries are needed to be executed. And then public random queries, like me just visiting your GraphQL URL and trying to, you know, do various arbitrary queries, I'd get rejected. So that's that's how that works. Um, and then the inverse, you could also say, hey, I want to allow everything to be public, but maybe like, let's say you had a query and maybe you actually wrote the query yourself, but under the hood, it's doing something bad on your server. Like maybe you have a bug in your code or a plugin has a bug and it's triggering that bug and it's causing like out of memory issues or something like that, or an infinite loop mm -hmm. or something like that. You want to reject that query until you have time to fix it, right? So what you could do is say, okay, I want to allow every query except for this specific one. I know this one, if this query gets executed, it's going to hurt my server. So I can actually go write that query, save it, and click deny. And so what that'll do is allow all queries to execute. But if that specific query is executed, it'll be rejected. So yeah. it's slightly less common or probably a lot less common scenario, <laughs> but it's, it's available. <laughs> Yeah, I just think I've had I've had a lot of people like want to secure the thing with like application passwords and stuff like that. And so this just I think offers like a much cleaner mechanism to do, yeah. do parts of that. Um, but rock on, I think we're like 15 minutes over. I do want to like let's uh anybody got any questions or anything you want us to go back over? I appreciate everybody like hanging in there with us till 15 minutes after the hour. If you got questions, type them in chat. Yeah, thank no, thank you, MJ, for, for hanging out with us. Yeah, cash queries do seem awesome. Yeah, like once and especially with fouls, like it makes it no no pain to switch. And with the, with you saw all I had to do to activate the APQ thing, like that was so easy. And it just allows everybody just to I think breathe easier at night. Um so that's that's awesome. Cool. Any any questions? Lingering questions? Maybe I'll point you all to some CTAs or whatever. Like obviously, definitely everybody I think who came in said they were interested in checking out Faust in some way. Um, so they've got their own website. Like I said out here, definitely check them out. Um, obviously, WP GraphQL um, has its own website. And wpgraphql.com is built on Faust and it's open yes. source. You can go to GitHub and look at the source code and see how it works if you want to. Yep. A and real example of Faust in pay, action. Pay attention. Jason just, I think, merged an amazing PR into the ACF beta extension beta that like really levels up that game. So stay tuned for some content around that. Yep. Um, obviously, I was hosting, like you saw me messing around doing some of this stuff with Atlas. This is this platform that we built specifically to um, run headless WordPress sites. So like obviously giving you a decent Jamstack experience. We're getting 80 second um, things. And like I said about ISR, I think that is important as you approach this, like look at how each platform treats it because it is a little bit different. Um, and I'm happy to kind of report like our movement is more towards like adopting Vercel's build output API. And I think we're in like the first stages of testing that internally. So it should be like a little bit more similar to the experience that you get there in the next couple of months. Um, but overall, a really cool pattern. And like Jason said, you know, I mean, if you can just remove earlier to the question about the mutation, right? If we remove all of this work that WordPress is doing, like it's going to make every other thing we're doing in WordPress just faster because it's not competing for resources. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll say is like, definitely follow our developer relations team, um, word.com slash builders. Uh, and there's not just headless WordPress stuff there. So if you're interested in traditional WordPress, we have a whole team writing, doing content on that. Um, obviously we've got the headless team here. And if you click on this, uh, you'll get sort of all of our, all of our social links. So the recording of this is going to be up on the YouTube channel. Uh, there's a discord, which I need to update this number. I think we're, we're pushing 1400 people up in there now. So click this link, come join us. Um, and lots of different content here on Faust, GraphQL, uh, everything you need to know about WP GraphQL. Fran just wrote this amazing post that taught me a bunch of stuff that I didn't know. So lot, lots of places to learn if you're getting into the space. Um, but 
yeah, thanks everybody for coming. If you got any questions, I mean, this is like my going once, going twice, sold thing. But maybe let's blow it up for Jason for coming and hanging out with me today and uh, talking about all this stuff. And I mean, making all the stuff and then ooh, set cash timeouts based on types. Yeah, yeah, this is cool. Um, go Google my, uh, go look at look at my gists on GitHub. I might have snippets for this. I'm, okay, I might not, see. but um, uh, I might. Uh, where you at? But we go. but yes, there is. Um, uh, what do I do? I'm hoping I have a snippet because it's a little hard to explain. Uh, just Google Google gists. Like just Google it. Can I here. just do gists? I don't know what it is. No, it's Let's not try. that. It's a different no. domain. Oh man. Uh, okay. Just Google like gists, Jason Ball or whatever. Jason Ball gists. Yeah. You'll find it. I guess. Where's Chat GPT? This is no, the, uh, there. We the go. Yeah, one. it is. It's it's the subdomain. I might have snippets in here. Let me see. I can't remember. I store a lot of snippets in here. Um, Ignore cash that, keys. Yeah. Cus- so here's a custom event listener though, right? So that would be let's look at the second helpful. one actually, or the third one, the ignore keys. Maybe. Is this one? Um so what okay, this isn't exactly it, but well, we can leave it, leave it. I'll explain this okay. though. So this this gets into some of the customization of like how WP GraphQL tags and invalidation work. So you could use some of this to customize it. So he's saying, is there a way to set cache timeouts based on types? This one is setting is customizing the cache keys based on type or based on whatever is in the query. So you could do similar. This instead of customizing the keys, what I'm doing here is I'm filtering the keys. You could you could do the same thing and filter the max age based on okay. whatever criteria. So there there's going to be a similar filter for the max age. I don't. You'd have to. Oh, look gotcha. It up. But okay. You would filter the max age, but you have you have a lot of information at your disposal, like the incoming query and all that kind of stuff. And so whatever context you have available there, you could do something similar to this. In this case, I'm doing it based on a very specific operation. So I say if it's the query named get post by slug, I'm going to customize how we tag this. So you could do it based on the name of your query. You could do it based on a node that's returned in the query. You could do it based on uh, type of thing that's, you know, it, it's kind of up to you to customize for your system. So yes, I don't, uh, I don't have a specific example, but you should be able to find examples in my gist that probably will point, point you in a close enough direction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and let me, while we're here too, do you have a, is the, where's the invite to the WP GraphQL Slack? Jason? Um, It's on the, on the footer. If you scroll all the way down, there's okay. like a Slack icon. You can click that. And join the WP yeah. GraphQL Slack. So we got a bunch of spaces and WP GraphQL Slack is like the WP GraphQL space. The the Discord that I pointed out earlier is like a little bit more broad. So it's more headless WordPress. We got a lot of people in there, lots of Faust questions. Um, but like for something like that, that this is the space you would want to be in is this WP GraphQL Slack. And there's cross-pollination, like a bunch of people hang out in both. Um, I hang out in both for sure. So Either one of those places are good places to join, depending on, you know, which which chat thing you you use. But um, yeah, definitely, that's a great question. That's cool. That's a cool. I didn't even think about that, but that's a neat a neat thing. Cool. Any other questions? All right, folks. Well, thanks again for hanging out with us, Jason. Thanks for hopping on here with me, putting all this together, and thanks for making it in the first place. Um, super valuable to people. Um, and I guess you can catch this recording up on YouTube. I try to turn them around pretty quick. So like maybe tomorrow or Monday, uh, it should be up. Um, but yeah, definitely join us. Please play around. Atlas has free sandbox accounts. All of the other stuff we've talked about is free and open source. So use it, you know, bang, bang around, give us some feedback. We would love to know what we could do to make it better. Um, we're all here really just trying to push the ecosystem forward in whatever way we can. Um, so yeah, check it out. Any of those things we'd we'd love to have your have your feedback and involvement in. All right, man. Rock on. So I'm gonna shut it down.